All right, today uh, we're talking about sanctification and glorification. First, let me um, turn this on. Oh, excuse me, this will help. Long pauses on the tape. Um, thank you all first for all your patience in me being gone so much. Trust me, I would rather have been here. Um, today we're dealing with the uh, doctrines of sanctification and glorification. Next week, the doctrine of the church. Then doctrine of the sacraments and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll deal with those as uh, one each hour. <clears throat> and then June 6th, the doctrine of the future and final exam. Again, these are the systematic theological understanding we have of these doctrines or theologies. You'll notice in the headings, sometimes I say the theology of sanctification and glorification. It's the same thing. The doctrine is simply a stated theological point. All right? um, I will make every effort next week to have for you the what you need to know um, documents so that you can be studying. It's difficult for me because I, in effect, have to plan, have to do the whole next three weeks in order to, to do that. But I will do everything I can to get that to you. I hope to have more time on this trip, and it did work out that way. Um, all right. As we begin to talk about sanctification and glorification, I want to start with the recognition that God's plan of salvation for us has three parts. Last time we met, six months ago, <laughs> we talked about salvation. Redemption. We spoke of it in terms of redemption, but God's plan of salvation, how we acquired that, how we accessed God's plan for us to be saved. Today we're going to expand our understanding of what God's plan of salvation is in terms of thinking about three uh, successive phases, if you will, of God's plan of salvation. And in that regard, we are talking of salvation as more than just being made righteous by the sacrifice of Christ and therefore saved but rather from that first step, what else is involved until we are in the presence of the Lord forever, okay? All of which is part of what our salvation is, since salvation involves us being made righteous by Christ so that we can spend an eternity with Him, all right? The first part of that is the one we've talked about. We talked about in terms of redemption, or in this case, we'll say justification. There's a number of words that you can use uh, that are either synonymous or very close to one another. Uh, they may have subtle technical differences, but we'll say justification today. Redemption was in the last class. Um, justification is God's unconditional love shown to us by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, paying the debt for our sins and making it possible for us to be saved. All right, The sacrifice Jesus made on the cross pays for our sins, according to the doctrine of penal substitution, which is, uh, remember, six months ago when we last met, we talked about different understandings of, of what salvation is over a period of time. Penal substitution is the Reformed doctrine and the one that is most common today amongst other Protestants as well. Um, and so Jesus paid the price for us, and in doing so, made us righteous before God and made it possible for us to be saved. Now, the... The thing that people often don't think about is while Jesus paid the price on the cross and therefore his action allows us to be saved, the application of that salvation to our lives is done by the Holy Spirit. Because when we hear the testimony, the witness of about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, it is the Holy Spirit that has to convict us in our hearts that what we are hearing is true convict us to the fact that we need this and allows us to accept it. And so in that way, it is the Holy Spirit that applies that justification to our lives. And in doing so, the first, that's the first way in which we experience sanctification. This is the second of the three parts of God's plan of salvation. Sanctification can be defined as the process by which we are made holy, both immediately as we accept Jesus Christ and are saved, and then progressively throughout the rest of our lives as we allow the Holy Spirit to further sanctify us, which means make us holy, and then make us more like Jesus. Now, I'm going to wrap, unwrap that a little bit uh, as we go along here, so I'm not going to say an enormous amount about that right now. But basically, the sanctification process, there's two aspects of it. There's the immediate applying 
of the redemptive act of Jesus to our lives in which we are made holy. We are made righteous before God at that moment. But because we are creatures who are habitually sinful, we then struggle with our habit of sin with the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And so the Holy Spirit needs to continue to work in us, to teach us not to sin, in effect, to help us get over that habit and to help us deal with that sin in terms of confession and repentance as we go along. So that's why sanctification is both an immediate application of the grace of Christ to our lives, and it then also is a progressive thing that happens throughout the rest of our life until our deaths. Right? We'll talk about that in a little more detail. The third aspect, and obviously sanctification, number two, and number three, glorification, is what we're going to be talking about today in more detail. Glorification is the final, complete perfection that we will experience when Jesus returns as we receive our resurrected bodies and we enter into the kingdom of heaven. So glorification is the ultimate act of sanctification, where we are finally prepared, ultimately prepared, to be in the presence of God the Father and of His Son Jesus throughout all eternity. Okay? Um, and so all three of these really are part of the plan of salvation. When we think of being saved or salvation, we often only think of the first one. But we need to remember, for instance, understanding number two will help you understand why Scripture says, work out your salvation. Well, that doesn't mean you have to do something else to get saved, but it means the application of the saving act is something that is an ongoing process as we are sanctified or made holy by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay? We're good so far? All right, let's open these up a little bit and talk about them. <clears throat> jump, jump ahead. Let's talk about first, we've already dealt with justification in our last class, uh, as we call it redemption. So you can go back and review that if you want to, but let's talk about number two and number three, which are ones that don't get talked about nearly as much. Everybody wants to get saved, but they don't recognize that it's a little bit, there's a little bit more to it than just the acceptance of Jesus, you know. I stepped out in the aisle at First Baptist Church of Mountain City, Tennessee on a Sunday night, you know, when I was in high school. Um, well, that was my profession of faith, my acceptance of Jesus. But God continues to work in me from that time onward and will continue to work in me until either the Lord returns or I die. Okay. So sanctification and glorification. Uh, sanctification is the one that affects us most as we continue in our lives. All right? So I've given you one definition, but let me give you another way of thinking about sanctification. The process of acquiring sanctity, or being made or becoming more holy. The word uh, sanctification comes from the Latin, two words, sanctus, which is holy, and facere, which means to make. And so to sanctify literally means to be made holy. It's also the translation, that's the Latin translation of the Greek word uh, hagiazo. Um, you may... You may have heard that the study of the saints in the history is hagiography. In effect, it's the study of holiness. Because the, the, word, the Greek word hagios means holiness. And so the, the form of that same word hagiazo means to be made holy, okay, to be sanctified. Um, maybe you hadn't heard of hagiography, but if you ever studied the saints, that just like you've got theology and soteriology and, you know, um, homartiology, well, you've got hagiography, which is the study of saints and the, the, those who were perceived as holy. I want to talk a little bit later about that, especially when we get to glorification. We just went through the process of the Catholic Church um, making formal saints out of John Paul II and John the XXIII. If you don't know who John the Twenty-Third was, since he was a while back, he was the one that initiated the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. They, they elected him, and he was quite old when they elected him, they didn't think John the Twenty-Third was going to do very much, he was still going to fill the space until they elected a real pope. And the first thing he did was he launched a complete revision of the Catholic Church, and that was reflected in the Second Vatican Council. So that's why he's made a saint, even though there are a lot of people in the, within the Catholic Church who weren't real keen on the Second Vatican Council. Okay, anyway, a um, little church history thrown in there, just a sprinkling. Um, to sanctify anything, to make it holy, means also to set it aside for a sacred purpose. 
there's a truth in saying that anything that exists, if it's fulfilling its true intended purpose, has been sanctified. You know, um, this pointer is is sanctified when I'm using it to point at things. All right. In other words, to fulfill the ultimate purpose. For us, it means to be set aside for relationship with God. And to grow in that. Which is what we were made for. So there's a very real sense in which it, it means to set something aside for a special purpose. And most often that special purpose is the thing that was really made for. Now, uh, sanctification can occur to almost anything. Particularly in an ecclesiastical setting. Next week we're going to talk about doctrine of the church. Which is ecclesiology, ecclesia, church. Um, but the idea of sanctification can apply to almost anything. As we read in Scripture, when you read about the both the preparation of the tabernacle and then the later the building and preparation of the temple, they talk about setting aside certain vessels that were to be used for, only for sacred purposes. Those were sanctified or made holy, set aside for that special purpose. There are special days. The, whole, the holidays. Where does the word holiday come from? Holy day. Um, the idea that there are certain days that are set aside for specialized or focused worship or in recognition of some critical aspect of the faith, those are holy days. They are sanctified days, if you will. Um, and especially the idea of sanctification applies to a person who has been committed to God and so is in the process of serving God but also being made more holy. This is the process of ordination. When we ordain someone, we are setting them aside, in effect, in a very real way, sanctifying them to fulfill a special purpose within the body of the church. That's what ordination is, and that's why it's important, because it's, it's a clear indication that someone is being set aside for a special, divinely ordained, that's where we get the word ordination, uh, purpose before God and for the sake of God's will and his work in the world, All right? So this is sanctification. Now, the, the particular aspect of how sanctification works varies from religious group to religious group. Um, the, some of them simply, simply believe it means the Holy Spirit is working in you and you grow as, as, you, are, you, know, as you become more holy, as you are more sanctified. Some believe that it is, um, it's almost a, an immediate process and then we just live it out. Uh, the holiness of Pentecostal churches, for instance, sanctification is how they would describe the giving of the spiritual gifts. You know, they talk, some talk about the second touch or um, the, the idea that once you become a Christian, that you, as you grow in the faith, you are given the, the, ex, the more expressive gifts especially uh, as a uh, part of your expression of holiness in your life. Right? So you can sort of understand how that's a separate thing because it is part of the sanctifying process for those who, uh, who part of their belief is the ex expression of the particularly more expressive gifts of the Holy Spirit, those that are more visible. I mean, nobody ever has an issue of wanting to see a demonstration of the gift of hospitality or of administration or of whatever. You know, but, of tongues, of interpretation, of prophecy, of healing, of some of those kinds of things. All right? Any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, there's an interesting aspect to this. The, uh, the, the Methodist churches uh, under John Wesley, because John Wesley was uh, associated with some of the early Pentecostal churches as well. There was a link uh, back there. Wesley advocated a thing called entire sanctification. Entire sanctification, which basically meant that a Christian should be cleansed of all the corrupting influence of original sin in his or her life. That all of original sin could be taken away. Um, and that as an offshoot of that, there are some sects that exist today that then say it is possible for people not to sin. That on the basis of entire sanctification, that, that our holiness is made so complete that we no longer have any of the effects of original sin, that we no longer have to sin, that we, we have the choice not to sin. We don't believe that. And we don't believe it for the very simple reason that Scripture has a number of very clear admonitions that we're not going to get that good in this life. First um, John 1.8 says, if you say you are without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. And John was writing to Christians. 
Um, but if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we certainly believe as part of that process of holiness, as we identify sin in our lives and we confess them, we're forgiven of those, cleansed, and we grow. We, we do improve and increase in holiness. Why do you think it is that some of the most pious people you probably have ever met are older? Right? Is that not true? Because as they, as they have accepted Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is in them, over a period of time, if they, are, if they are willing to work with the Holy Spirit, we're going to talk about that. If they are willing to receive the sanctification the Spirit provides, then over a period of time, they become more Christ-like. They become more holy. And some of that is a, is a process that requires time for the Holy Spirit to grow us in that way. And that's why many of the holiest of people have been older. The great saints of the church usually aren't recognizing that. And you know, when they're in their 20s. There are exceptions. You, know, you get St. Jones and other people who were very pious and very very sanctified early in life. But for the most part, it takes time. This is a process. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit more. Um, our sanctification, we believe, and this is part of the Reformed belief, is not a product of our own merits and efforts. It's not that, okay, I accepted Jesus and now I need to work really hard because it's by my own efforts that I'm going to become more holy. We don't believe that. It is by the merits of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to give you some verses in a few minutes to talk about that. It is by the merit of Christ being applied to our life by the Holy Spirit that we are made more holy. Now, we have to cooperate. God does not force himself on anyone, neither to save us nor to sanctify us. So we have to be receptive. We have to, you know, when the Holy Spirit says, you need to stop doing that, I have to listen. Or I'm not going to grow in holiness. But it is not by my merit that I will become more holy, that I will become more Christ-like, that I will become more sanctified. But rather, by the merit of Jesus Christ applied to my life by the Holy Spirit, as I am willing to accept that. Fair? Okay. Sanctification occurs as a result. It's the second step or the next step after our justification, our initial salvation. Upon our salvation, when we receive Jesus Christ and accept what he has done for us, the Holy Spirit enters us. And at that point, you know, there is a moment in each of your lives, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you accepted Christ, there was a moment in your life when you were completely without sin. You were reborn. You were made over again. You are a new creature, the New Testament talks about. All things, all the old things were put aside. But, while we were no longer hostages to death, and we were free at that instant to live as God desires, we have really bad habits. We are habitually addicted to sinful behavior, and the devil doesn't help. He's always there, you know, trying to get us to do this stuff. Because of our habitual sin, sanctification, the instantaneous sanctification we received by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we accepted Christ, then becomes an additional process of progressive sanctification throughout our lives, by which we then are made more holy. And there are a lot of factors in that. In fact, some very practical things that we can understand and apply in order to be sanctified, to become more holy, to become more Christ-like. Um, one of those things is prayer. The more we experience prayer in our lives, where we are in communion with God, where we are experiencing God's presence, the more ready we are to accept the direction and the growth and the holiness the Holy Spirit can provide to us. So prayer, relationship with God. Prayer doesn't mean telling Him what we want. Prayer means to be in communion, communication, in relationship with God. As we do that, and we do that more and more in our lives, we become more sanctified, more holy. Another way that's critically important is right here. You know, God has given us the Word to teach us, to grow us, to help us understand Him, ourselves, how He and we are supposed to relate to one another. And so the more you are in the Word, the more holy you will become, the more sanctified you will be. So that's a critical aspect. 
Another way, which we often don't experience, and, and which I really want us to find ways in our church to, to do this more, is through um, worship. And when I say do it more, reading a scripture, prayer, but for us to find ways to open our hearts and ourselves for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our worship efforts, in our worship services. Um, we're a little too stiff. And I want to find ways to get past that. But all of us, if we worship in spirit and in truth, the act of worship opens us up to the Holy Spirit being more active in our lives and to sanctify us. And then, as we are being directed by the Holy Spirit, there's a sense in which good works can help us become more holy. When I do actions that are motivated by compassion, motivated by a desire to serve God and to serve the needs of others, as long as I'm not doing it for credit or doing it because I think it's going to make me okay with God, as long as I'm doing it because I believe it's the right thing to do out of compassion for people or out of a desire to serve God in those ways, then that also will allow the Holy Spirit to be more active in my life to help me grow. That's why compassionate ministries are critically important for a Christian in service to the people who have needs, but it's also critically important to us spiritually. Um, how you spend your money. I've said over and over and over again in our church that uh, our, uh, our attitude toward money in the Western world is the biggest single spiritual hurdle that we have trouble getting over. Once we no longer have a possessiveness about our material things and our money, once we're willing to share them, God gives us, gives us money and material possessions for two reasons. To enjoy them. God wants us to enjoy them. But then he wants us to share them. And when we focus only on, on the first part of that, you know, enjoying them and don't share them, that becomes a barrier that prevents the Holy Spirit from being active in our lives. Because we're not paying attention to God, we're paying attention to our money. If we will loosen our hands and release that, the Holy Spirit then has more opportunity to work in us. Okay? So there are a lot of those little practical pieces that will, as much as anything else, open the channel so that the Holy Spirit we can receive him and be responsive to the efforts of the Spirit to sanctify us. Make sense? Questions about that? Yes. When we talk about good works, um, we usually think about, the first thing that comes to mind is giving to the poor, giving to the people, you know, and, and contributing to somebody's welfare. Mm -hmm. Is good works also my preparation to be more surrendered to God, I, it, it is personal. I mean, I, in my mind, I, I need to work on myself first before I start working on others. And the more I work on myself, the better I can work on others. But is, is it complimentary or what? Well, what you're saying is true, but it is complimentary. You know, there's some extent to which the things that can be most healing and most beneficial to me spiritually is being open in a compassionate way to other people's needs. So it's not either or. And it's not even actually a sequence. I, I the family I came from, my father, and you know, we were not well to do, um, and they'd grown up very, very poor. I mean, my grandparents, none of them had running water in their house. Um, and so that came from a very poor background. But my father, whenever the idea came up of giving to a need that somebody else had, his, his response was always exactly the same. Charity begins at home. Well, that's true. I, charity does begin. In other words, meet the needs of your own family is an obligation we have. Okay, I buy that. But, you know, that he uses an excuse for never giving anything to anybody. <laughs> okay. um, and so we can't go that far. But yeah, it is true that that we, you know, we have to be concerned about the well-being in our household, in our family, and also our own well-being. Um, the healthier you are, the more you can serve somebody else. But it's not, there's a danger about saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retrench and focus on my own spirituality and my own needs and, and et cetera, et cetera, and then at a certain point, I will be capable of reaching out and caring for other people. It doesn't work that way. No. Because if we pull in too much, we're going to find that we actually diminish instead of expand in our ability to outreach. In, in, in our society today, 
we find example after example after example of people living their own kind of life and giving out to somebody and they count as good works and but they themselves are rotten. Yeah, well the ultimate good work is accepting Jesus Christ. In fact, when you read passages in the New Testament and that suggests that we will be evaluated based upon our good works, the first good work is receiving God in Jesus Christ. That's the That's best it. work you can do. That's it. All right. And then there are ways that some of the things I just mentioned, which are all good works, because they open us up to the influence of the Holy Spirit so that we can become more Christ-like. And as we do that, we will have both the inclination and the ability to, to give more. Uh, you know, and to be compassion ministries involve not only caring for the physical needs, but also caring for the spiritual needs. I mean, evangelism is a compassion ministry, if you believe that, you know, if you understand that. Uh, because we are concerned about the eternal welfare of somebody. Uh, not, we, we should, we are and should be concerned about making sure they have enough food and that they're healthy and that they have, you know, they have clean water and a place to live that is secure and, and all of those things are very important. It is even more important, and it's not to diminish any of those things, it's even more important that we are concerned about their eternal welfare. Because if we have somebody live a healthier, you know, more secure life now and they die and spend an eternity, you know, in condemnation, which is what we believe, then that doesn't help. It needs to be both. You know, Jesus was concerned about both. He was concerned about the physical needs, healing, feeding, raising from the dead even, and he was concerned about the spiritual needs, teaching the, the truth of the kingdom of God. It's not either or. In our, our personal lives as Christians, our service and our ministry as churches or whatever, has to be both. John? Um, the issue of sanctification, I mean, Men have reduced it to a science, you know. They, we, we've divided it up and learned so much what it is. Wesley had one view, others had other views. But the issue is to become sanctified. And to be open to the Holy Spirit. Exactly. And and um, I'm, I am presently reading a book that has really, and I have enjoyed it. It's by someone you know, I'm sure you know, Dallas Willard. And it's a book called Hearing God, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God. And I would recommend that as something that would help us and assist us along this path of becoming more like, more Christ-like. That's an extremely good book. You get it on Amazon. I've got it on Amazon by Dallas Willard. I right. recommend that. Everything Dallas Willard has written. He died just this past Recently. year. Recently. Yeah. Um, his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, which I mentioned, I referred to in our, in our class on spiritual disciplines, it really is a, a call to Christian responsibility in how we live our lives. Um, in a very non-condemning, non-judgmental non kind of way, but it basically is a call to, you know, take it seriously. The Get in there. Conspiracy. Yeah, the Divine Con Conspiracy is another Dallas Miller book. He's really good. I had, I had uh, dinner with him one night. Um, not just he and I, there were several of us there, but he and I were sitting next to each other. We spent the evening talking. Uh, and and um, fascinating guy. So we were doing some stuff with, um, it was in Dallas, and we were dealing, oh, I just lost the name of the organization. They do the revival uh, banquets and stuff. I'll think of it in a minute. It started in England. Um, their logo is a big question mark that a guy's carrying. So anyway. But um, we were both there to try to help this organization and uh, had a great evening together. He's, he's a great guy. Look forward to talking to him more. Yes? Just to get back to our Arthur's uh, first opening statement, I think Shakespeare really answers that uh, when he says the quality of mercy is not spring. Mm -hmm. It is the receiver and the giver right. are blessed. Uh, so in all works that we do, with the right internal attitude and approach, we are being blessed, but we are blessing others. Right. Yeah, we we don't we don't care for the needs of others physically others physically and spiritually because we have to or even because we should. I remember counseling, it used to be a big thing, they say, Oh, you're you're shooting all over yourself, right? <laughs> I should do this, I should do that. And the danger is that that becomes an onerous thing that becomes a burden. We should not be compassionate spiritually or physically because it's a burden, but rather because it's a blessing. It's an opportunity. 
an opportunity for us to reflect the grace and love of God to, to people who have needs of various kinds, physical and spiritual, but also with a recognition that it returns tenfold to us in terms of spiritual blessing. Press down, overflowing, the New Testament talks about. And that, you know, that's that's why we you know, why we're in this business. When it becomes a natural part of you, right. then, yeah, it, you, you don't think twice, it just happens, you know? You help the old lady across the street, or... Whether she wants to go or not. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's an old Saturday Night Live. Yeah, well, that's so. the old little boy. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. You know, I help ten old ladies across the street, and ten old ladies are saying, but I didn't want to cross the street. Yeah. But uh, I know uh, some people think I'm very weird because I don't, I don't see color, I don't see religion or race or any of those things. It just, my glasses mm -hmm. aren't focused at me. And I'll notice some person, old and different, trying to do a task, uh, to get out of the chair, you know, uh, and I'll put my arm up and say, let me help you. And I help them up and say, where are you going? Well, there's a car, they just have to cross the sidewalk, right, but right, you know okay. it's such a struggle for them. So you accompany them. Okay. And I know this happened at Costco one day, and that old guy was trying to get out of the car, and obviously he's the driver, because he's left standing there. Okay, shorten it up a little bit. And okay. he's struggling. <laughs> and, and I took him just to the nearest chair, which is from here to there. Right. And when the man came, I said, he's over here. Yeah. He said, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Like, you know, I'm thinking, my goodness. And the old fellow said, she's an angel. Good. She's an angel. So there was the two different concepts of like, can I kidnap and get something to this old man? Right. Or, as the old fellow said, no, she gave of herself. Yeah, and when we realize again that sanctification means to be set apart, to be set apart for a special responsibility, and that's sort of what the spirit of the disciplines is about, is the book, the Dallas Willard book, means that we are, as Christians, we are set apart for a very special responsibility, a very special role. Um, and, and we need to be aware of that and take that seriously and grow in that. Okay? We are set apart for a special divine purpose. So let's look at a couple of verses here that have to do with sanctification. Um, 2 Timothy 2, those who cleanse themselves. Now, this, I'll stop there because this passage, it starts out by saying in a large house there are a lot of utensils. Some made of gold, some made of wood, etc., etc. And um, the important part of this is those who cleanse themselves. We have a responsibility in this. It is, it is the merit of Jesus Christ that makes it possible, and we'll look at it in just a second. But it is an application of the Spirit to our lives, but we have to participate. We have to be willing to accept the cleansing, in effect, cleanse ourselves. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter, meaning from being a, the, the less worthy, uh, will be instruments for special purposes set aside for a special purpose, made holy, useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. That's what it means to be sanctified. To be set aside for a special purpose, to be made holy, to be useful to the master, prepared to do any good work. Okay? A second passage, Galatians 5, Paul writes, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We just were looking at Romans 8 in the Bible study this morning. And Paul is making this distinction. You can either go the way of the flesh or you can go the way of the spirit. It's either the darkness or the light. You have to choose. And if you choose the darkness, then you need to ask yourself seriously if you do have the spirit of Christ. And if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't have Christ. So we're told, walk by the spirit. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not so that you are not to do whatever you want. We have to make a decision that we're not going to go there. That's exactly what we were talking about in Romans 8 this morning in our Bible study. We have to make a decision. I, I told the example, a few of you were in there, that Carolyn and I, when we watch TV, we purchase the shows we want and stream them online. So we only watch what we pick. And we never see commercials, because there's no commercials on those. Well, we're in Seattle, 
in a hotel room in the evening and we turn the TV on. The stuff that's on prime time now, everything from Ultimate Fighting Championship, you get to watch somebody's teeth and blood splattered across the, you know, the fighting ring and people screaming for blood, and that's prime time entertainment. Or, you know, the Real Housewives of wherever it is, Atlanta, Orange County, they've done it almost everywhere now. The horrendous things these people say to each other, the malicious things they do to each other, and that's entertainment. Those are the things of the flesh that we are told don't go there. Now, those are just the vivid examples because Carol and I are like, what the? What is wrong with this world? We, we pay for that for entertainment. So, we have to make a choice. You know, we are not to do whatever we want. Just because some things are, we think it's fun, it's pleasurable, it gets our adrenaline going when we watch these, these the Ultimate Fighting Championship guys kicking each other's brains out, it doesn't mean we ought to be watching it, even though it gives us an adrenaline rush and we think that's pleasurable. We should not be watching all of this crappy programming where people are being malicious and trying to hurt each other, undercut each other, in order to gain some advantage to win this reality, whatever it is. We don't need to go there, and we shouldn't. You want to argue with me about that? <laughs> I, I mean, I could not imagine watching commercial network television now. Um, even some of the cooking shows get pretty rough. I read an interesting statistic uh, that now um, far more people watch cooking shows than cook. <laughs> we spend more hours watching cooking shows than we do cooking. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. And then, Hebrews 10, 14, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. This is one of the verses that tells us it is not us doing it. And we have a responsibility. You know, we, the idea of cleansing ourselves, of making the decision to walk in the right direction, we have a responsibility of accepting the leadership the Holy Spirit gives us. But it is by the one who made the one sacrifice that we are being made holy. Without the sacrifice of Christ, none of it would matter. It is His merit, His action, not ours, that makes it possible for us to grow in holiness. Some more verses. Just before that, Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Again, his action, not ours. All we do is be willing to receive it. As someone, it's often been observed, the gift of Jesus Christ is exactly that. It's a gift. And Jesus stands and offers himself to us. But a gift is not a gift unless you're willing to receive it. He stands there and holds it out, and we don't take it from him, we don't receive it, we don't accept the gift, then we don't get the gift. It's as simple as that. 1 Peter 1, 14-16, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to be without sin. Sanctification has nothing to do with living a sinless life. The sects that believe that are wrong. And, and they're not paying attention. Because Scripture is very clear about that. As I say, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that's true before we accepted the sacrifice for Jesus, it's also true. My sin every day causes me to fall short of the glory of God, and it is only by the grace of God that that is forgiven, and that I am still kept from, con from condemnation. The first, first verse of Romans 8 that we're looking at is, For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I can't, 
I can't sin in such a way that I'm going to lose my salvation. Now, the Catholic Church does not believe that. The Catholic Church believes it is possible to commit a mortal sin, which mortal means we would die spiritually because of it, even if we've accepted Jesus Christ. We do not believe that. Now, um, I'm going to, when I talk about glorification in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the fact that glorification is the Protestant uh, answer to purgatory. Um, what happens at the end, kind of thing. But we need to recognize that there is no condemnation for us, but that still doesn't mean we're perfect. We're not going to be without sin. Um, the script, scripture says that all people will go through judgment. Those who are in Christ and those who are not. We will all stand before the great white throne of judgment. Apparently the first thing that happens is they open the book of life, and whoever's name is written on that is guaranteed. Those are the ones for whom there is no condemnation. We are in Christ. Our name is written in His book of life. So we will be saved. We will spend an eternity with the Lord. But at once that that first big cut is made between those whose names are in the book and those aren't, then each of us will be answerable for how we lived our lives. Were we receptive? Did we seek to be holy? Did we seek to be obedient to the direction? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So how well are we loving him? And I believe that the judgment that occurs there, and I had a couple people in, in Bible study of the last few weeks, well, last few weeks, I have many, but prior to that, that really struggle with this idea that we're going to be judged. And I said, well, the judgment is going to be, were you, you know, I think, I think the Lord who sits on the great white throne of judgment will say, you are my child. You are part of my family. You will be with me forever. But for some of us, the next words out of his mouth, which will be the worst thing that ever happened to us, will be, but you were not a good child. And there were times I was not pleased with you. That kind of, that, that's not going to get worse. It's, it's not going to go further than that. But that alone will tear our hearts out. For others, it will be, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we should seek. That's what, what it means for us to be holy. So that when we stand before him, we're not going to be perfect, we're not going to be without sin. But have we sought to be like him? So that we will receive, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Again, some people really have trouble with the idea that, that there is going to be something negative, some negative judgment against us when we stand before the throne. Well, the question is, you accepted Jesus, but did you obey him? Or how well did you obey him? Okay? Make sense? Is, is, is that part of us losing our rewards <clears throat> on that day? Um, Explain a little bit more what you mean. Yeah, so you, you are going to be saved, but you will lose the reward. Well, th That's there, what the Bible says. there is talk of you know crowns in heaven that some people will, you know some people have better seats at the at the great banquet. You know, the, there's not a lot of detail about that, so we don't have a lot about it. But the idea is that there will be some who will be acknowledged more and and praised more. And and Scripture tells us it's not going to be who you think. <laughs> Amen. All right. It will be those who were quiet who you don't even know, they spent a life in prayer, in, in intercession for others, in giving all that they could to care for the needs of others. The ones who I believe the Lord is going to hold up as being those who truly fulfill all that He desired for them as His children and servants are probably not going to be the ones we think. A whole lot of pastors are going to be at the far end of the table Okay. Then Hebrews 12, 14 to 15, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, again, an initial holiness is granted to us when the Holy Spirit comes to us, into us when we accept Jesus. But then from there, there is the process of seeking. And all of these stations, these comments about being holy. Jesus makes it possible, the Holy Spirit does the work, all they're in effect saying is, let that happen in your life. Be open to it. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. And He will make you more holy. Ross, I would, I would, I would add that uh, uh, holiness for the Christian is more natural 
than sin. As a sinner, we pursue sin because that's just what we do. That's what we are. But as a Christian, it becomes our nature to seek after that which is pleasing to Him. And we are, we are, we still struggle. I mean, we struggle. You know, right. We, we fight. We struggle. But but our our trajectory is no longer towards that sin of the flesh, but rather. The holiness of God. Right. And I think um, it's true. As I say, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, when we accept Jesus Christ, for that instant, we are pure and holy. And we only by the power of the Holy Spirit do we have the ability to grow in holiness. Because our, our old nature is dark and broken and sinful. The problem we have is that we are habitually sinners. And so we fall into those bad habits. Whereas, you're right, I mean, as a Christian, um, having the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, there's all, even when I'm doing something I shouldn't, I know it. I'm aware of it. I don't get at all confused about what's right and what's wrong. Now, I may be confused while I'm doing it, but very quickly after that, I'm going, Oh, pause. Why did you say that? You thought you were being cute, but you were being mean. Or whatever it is. Okay. So, um, yeah, but our, our natural, we would not have the ability at all, apart from the Holy Spirit, to be growing in holiness. Yes, Bob? That last verse really bugs me. Because, uh, <laughs> well, we'll take it out then. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of people that need to bump off. Yeah, uh, make every effort to live in peace. Um, That's a lot. What was I just working on? Something I was just working on that, um, I guess it was a letter I was writing or something, that the idea that we, as we seek, um, so often when we say, I'm being persecuted, I'm righteous. I don't deserve this. And so therefore, I have a right to lash out. I have a right to defend myself. I have a right to, you know, put that person in, in their place. Whenever we feel that, and that's a very natural thing, we then have to remember all Jesus went through, and he didn't deserve any of that. He's the only one who really didn't deserve it. Down deep, I probably do. And so the model we have, which we don't always like, Bob, <laughs> is that even though we are being done wrong without deserving it, we still are supposed to try to live in peace. As far as possible, be at peace with all persons. You can have a neighbor that you maybe don't get along the best with, but there's always a way to live with them in peace, whether right. it's totally ignoring them or, <laughs> you know, but at least you're not throwing paint bombs at your house or whatever. You know? Right. Sometimes it does mean just to withdraw. Do you? And we all know when the Holy Spirit came into us. At the moment you, you accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came in you. I know, but I, I don't know when that was. Yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting because um, a friend of mine who's an Anglican said one time, you know, you other Protestants, you're always talking about um, bringing people in, in terms of evangelism, bringing people in. He said, but we have a tradition of bringing people up, meaning as children. Um, a great interview that uh, Garrison Keeler had with the Wittenberg Door. You guys remember the Wittenberg Door? It was a Christian humor magazine, a parody magazine, actually. It was sort of like um, Mad Magazine for Christians. <laughs> really, I mean, it was very funny. Actually, they got to the point, though, it was a little bit too cynical. It was a little bit too uh, harsh. But they did some great things over the years, including interviews with people that, you know, other people weren't interviewing. And they interviewed Garrison Keillor. And the interviewer, because Garrison Keillor is a professed Christian, the interviewer said to Garrison Keillor, when were you saved? And Garrison Keillor said, I don't know. And the interviewer went, aha! <laughs> As though he got it. And Garrison Keillor said, I don't know when I was saved, but I know when I knew I was saved. Which may be what you're saying. You know, at some point, and you may not even know exactly when that was, you were aware of the fact that I'd accepted this. 
Was Garrison Keillor the, 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 the cook? No, Prairie Home Companion. Prairie Home Companion, like Wolf and Days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The radio personality, oh, yeah. and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's been a quiet, quiet week in Lake Wolfgang, my hometown there yeah. on the edge of the prairie. Yeah. Okay. Um, tomato butt. No, I'm not. Okay. We don't know what you're asking. Anyway. Um, and that's true. Some people don't know the da hour or the day that they were saved, but at some point they made that decision and we're not even maybe aware of it till later. In fact, C.S. Lewis, his, his brother Warney, his older brother Warney, who'd been in the, in the army, uh, was home and Lewis had been under the influence of J.R.R. Tolkien and a number of other Christians had been struggling with this faith thing because he'd been an agnostic for a long time and he's an adult now. Okay, he became a Christian as an adult. And he, um, his brother Warney had a motorcycle with a sidecar and they decided they were going to go to the zoo and Lewis was struggling with all this stuff. He gets in the sidecar, they go to the zoo and Lewis later, uh, in Surprise by Joy, says, when I got in that sidecar, I was not a Christian. When I got out of the sidecar at the Jew at, at the at the zoo, I was a Christian. I don't even know exactly when it happened, but somewhere in that trip, I stepped over that line and said, "I believe it's true." Okay, um, and so there wasn't a he can pick a he can pick a day and everything, but the, but his point is, it's possible to have made that decision and only realize in hindsight that I came to that conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, who saves me by His sacrifice. So some people don't know the day. Garrison Keillor doesn't know the day. But he, but again, he says, I don't know when I was saved, but I know when I know, knew that I was saved. I think that's often the point with, with children. I know it was for me. When I was seven years old, I was at a youth rally with my father, and the invitation was given, and I stayed afterwards and talked to the pastor. And as he explained it to me, even as a young child, I had that assurance that had already taken place, right. and I had the picture in my mind of a child evangelism class when I was about five, the flannel graph for the cross, and da 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 da. I love flannel graphs. And uh, there was just that sweet assurance. I had no questions after yeah. that. Yeah. But don't ask me the date or time. Yep. Yeah. But I knew. Yeah. Well, I. There can be no more gratifying thing for a pastor than than this. I was at. Um, a number of weeks ago, I was preaching, and the Indian family was here. You know, the, the family that have 27 children? How yeah, they have. It's like uh, nine. And um, <laughs> and um, Brian, I think his name is, the father, came up to me, uh, or actually called me later, and said I was preaching about what Jesus did for us, and he said his six-year-old daughter turn, turned to him and said, so that means Jesus died for me, too? <laughs> Okay, there's nothing better for somebody who, who tries to preach the word than for a six-year-old to get that. Okay, um, and it can happen very young and, and not know when. And Carolyn became a Christian very, very early as well. So, um, yeah, but that we may not, whenever it is that we accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit did come into us, even if we're not sure when that was. Um, Carolyn used to have, and again, some some Pentecostal uh, charismatic folks don't don't believe that the Holy Spirit comes into you at the moment of your salvation. They believe the Holy Spirit comes in later, and that's when you experience the expressive gifts of the Spirit. That's not that's not the Orthodox <coughs> Christian view. Um, there's a dear lady who was in our church, and she and Carolyn, I probably mentioned this before, had this running thing where. Where she would say to Carolyn, oh, Carolyn, I so wish you had the Holy Spirit. And Carolyn would say, well, I do have the Holy Spirit. And she'd say, so you speak in tongues? Carolyn said, no, I don't speak in tongues. Because her perception was, and her, the belief of her, denom her denomination or group was, and she's part of our church, she was a member of our church too, was that the Holy Spirit comes later, and when the Holy Spirit fills you, every time a person speaks in tongues. That's not what we believe. We believe that everyone, upon the moment they accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into them, gives them an initial sanctification, and then that sanctification process proceeds. Others, now not all Pentecostal and charismatic people believe, believe that, that the Holy Spirit comes in later. Many of them do believe the Holy Spirit comes into you, but then there's a certain time in your growth, your spiritual growth, your sanctification process, where the Holy Spirit 
expresses himself through you, through the, the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Okay, Mike? When I, when I was 39, when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I went forward after, after a, a concert, and they, asked, they did an altar call, and they laid hands on me at this Pentecostal church, and I had this really weird feeling that I was filling up, like a, sort of like an empty vessel filling up. Yeah. And there's a, there was a videotape going fast forward in my brain of all the things I had done that were wrong in violation. It went on for two hours after. Yeah, yeah, and it really it's a it, long tape. Yeah, it was a long <laughs> tape. Especially on fast forward. It was really a dramatic situation, and I remember exactly what it was. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, for me, Sunday night, about the 29th verse of Just As I Am, Mountain City, Tennessee, First Baptist Church, I know when I accepted Jesus. Uh, but that's not true for everyone, and that's okay, you know. Um, one last verse that I'll give you for sanctification. Again, Paul uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It is by the grace of Jesus Christ, his merit, that we are sanctified. He does the work in us. We simply have to let him. That's the process of sanctification. Okay? All right, let's take a break. Okay, let's talk now about the third category, uh, or the third step, I guess I should say, in the process of salvation, which is glorification. Now, glorification, whereas the justification, that when we accept Jesus, and sanctification, which starts at that moment and continues throughout our lives, those are... For now, in effect. Uh, but glorification doesn't happen until the end of, well, it happens when the Lord returns. The definition, glor glorification is the final completed perfection that we will experience when Jesus returns as we receive our resurrected bodies and enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this is sort of the culmination of the sanctification process. Uh, Another way to think of it is that glorification is the completion, the consummation, the perfection, the full and final realization of our salvation. Recognizing salvation is justification, sanctification, and glorification. Right? This is what happens when the Lord returns. And we go through the final stages of being prepared for heaven. Now, uh, having said that, you need to realize that different Different churches have different ideas about what glorification means. In the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Communion, glorification is the process of officially recognizing someone as a saint. They just went through the process of acknowledging the glorification of John Paul II and John XXIII. So for them, glorification means to become a saint. So they have a very different understanding of that. And the reason there's a, that, um, one, of the, one of the things about the, uh, and I, I also should say that the, the Eastern Orthodox churches have a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar view of glorification, in that it's the idea of achieving sainthood. Now, when someone becomes a saint, it's not just that the church, you know, stamps them as being really cool. Um, there are other, both in the Catholic and the Orthodox traditions, there are other things that are seen as associated with them. For instance, it's fairly common for a saint to, um, a saint's flesh after they die to be perceived as being incorruptible, meaning they don't, they don't smell bad. Um, the, 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 the saints who have died, they say, give off a floral scent or a honey-flavored scent. Their flesh does not decay. It's not the same as mummification. They say that they just sort of, you know, Yellow a little bit and stay there, okay? So they have very particular kinds of ideas of this being a miraculous occurrence. It's not just that the church acknowledges that somebody was really cool. It's also true, there's a whole lot of theology behind this that we probably shouldn't get into right now, but um, there is a, a saint being identified as someone who was particularly sanctified, who has achieved a level of holiness, the, because the church, the Catholic Church, is the, um, 
they have responsibility for retaining and distributing grace. Grace is perceived by the Catholic Church as being uh, rather like a commodity. Well, a person who is a saint is perceived as having had more grace than they needed for their own salvation. And when they die, they contribute the, the extra grace to the Catholic Church. So they then can distribute it the way they want. Aren't they supposed to also have proof of certain miracles that they Exactly. Have in order to be, um, and the Catholic Church, unlike the, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church goes through a two-step process. Beatification, which means blessedness, in which they acknowledge them as being a great person of spirit, and then they go through a process of trying to identify a miraculous, I think there has to be at least two miracles. Two or three. That are associated with the person, where someone, by praying to them or... In some other way, they, a person identifies them as being responsible for a healing or some other miraculous event. Okay. And again, so you understand, it isn't just sainthood in the Catholic and the Orthodox Church is not just a matter of them deciding these people were special. They do see it as being a supernatural and miraculous kind of event and occurrence. That is what glorification means to the Catholic, the um, Orthodox, and many of the Anglican people in the Anglican some Anglicans are just like, you know, Protestants. I mean, they're just, some of them, most of them don't consider themselves Protestants, by the way. Um, if you tell Denny, um, not Denny Reiberg, Denny from the Christchurch Anglican, he and I've had that discussion a number of times where he says, I'm not a Protestant. And I said, really? You know, um, then how do you deal with the fact that the theology of the Anglican Church is based on Calvinism? I mean, the Anglican Church, the Anglican Communion, basically, in order to try to get the Catholics and the Protestants to stop killing each other, the Elizabeth I, in her wisdom, created a church that looks like Catholicism, but has a theology that's Protestant. So everybody settled down. But it is the Westminster Confession, which is the basic confession of the Anglican Communion, is also a Reformed confession, because it is Calvinist. Well, when I told Danny that, he said, well, yeah, I know, but... I don't have to like it. <laughs> um, within our faith, the Protestant um, faith, there are two events identified as being part of the event, that will be part of the eventual glorification. Glorification hasn't happened for anybody yet because it happens when Jesus comes back. It happens when he returns. Those who are still alive will be called, well, the first thing is those who are dead in Christ will be taken up out of the grave and will meet the Lord in the air. Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians. It's a passage we often use in memorial services. Um, then those who are still alive in Christ, meaning they've accepted Christ but have not died yet, they then, will, as a second step, will be drawn up with him. But there, the two events that are part of the perfection of glorification will be, one, the receiving of the elect um, of their perfected bodies, and then the entering of the elect into the kingdom of heaven. Right? Those are the two aspects of glorification as we understand that. And again, recognizing that this is the third stage of Christian, of the development of Christian salvation. There is justification, then sanctification, and then glorification. Um, and one of the reasons it's called glorification, it, it actually doesn't mean we're going to be glorified. It means that we will take on a form that will express the glory of God. It is God that is being glorified when we are perfected. Because we will finally become what He intended for us to be in the first place, and He will receive the praise and glory for that. So quite literally, the glorification, which is us getting our perfected bodies and entering into heaven, it is God's glorification, not ours. As He will be praised for that. Now, interestingly... Glorification is the Protestant alternative to purgatory. The means by which the elect receive perfection before entering the kingdom of heaven. Now, how much do you all know about purgatory? We talked about this in class this morning, too, in a Bible study, rather. Um, it is the Catholic belief, first, the Catholic, and I'm not picking on the Catholics. I have to always say that because some people leave here and say, Ross is, is slamming the Catholics. I'm not. But part of how we understand our faith is to understand it in relationship to others. And the predominant one we deal with here is Catholicism. The Catholic Church believes that there are two kinds of sins. 
mortal sins and venial sins. Now, we're talking about people who are in the church, who have been baptized, who are seen as being in Christ. A venial sin is like the general old kind of sin that we all commit. Mortal sins are sins that will damn you. Even if you have accepted Christ, even if you are in the Lord, the Catholic belief is there are still some things, if you do them, then all bets are off. You have lost your salvation. You will be damned. But then venial sins are those other sins we commit which are not, are not significant enough to, to damn us, to, to take away our salvation, but that still have to be dealt with somehow. Now the ordinary way that the Catholic Church, for people who are alive, the ordinary way that's done is by confessing your sins, receiving um, forgiveness from a priest. Now it has to be somebody who is a priest. Bishops are just promoted priests. Okay. Um, even monks have to confess their sins to a priest. A monk cannot take confession. And so a priest has to hear your confession, and he may give you instructions on what to do by way of penance, and you're required to do the penance, and then you can be forgiven. But if you have not confessed your sins, or particularly if you die without confessing your sins, the belief is that you will enter into the afterlife still carrying those sins. And so, therefore, there has to be a process by which those sins are cleaned up or removed, scrubbed off. That process is purgatory. There's an intermediate place between earth and heaven, or between heaven and hell, probably, you'd say, because it's in the afterlife, where those who are in Christ, who have accepted Christ, but still died with sins on their record, go there to be cleaned up. And the period of time you spend in purgatory is dependent upon... How, how many of your sins you're still carrying with you. This is the reason um, that the Catholic Church has the, they have seven sacraments, whereas we have two. And one of the seven that the Catholic Church has is extreme unction, or last rites. I found out when I was gone, somebody called here and said that there was a Presbyterian woman who was dying, and they, the doctor had said, you need to get somebody to come and give her last rites. So they called here and asked if I would come and give them last rites, give her last rites. Well, somebody else, actually, they ended up calling Norm, I think, because his number's in the paper, too. And Norm said, we don't do that. <laughs> you know, we will go to someone who's dying and pray with them and, and try to comfort them and encourage them, but we don't do last rites. Um, because the idea there is, it's a last confession of sin and a last declaration of forgiveness of those sins by a priest, the ideal being that that happens, and then they die immediately so that they don't have time to have any other bad thoughts. Uh, or do anything else wrong, say anything inappropriate, so that they leave this life with all of their sins forgiven. Now, we don't believe that. For one thing, and I've said this before in this class, the very idea of purgatory suggests that Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf was not sufficient to cleanse us of all of our sins. And there needs to be some other process to do that. Well, Protestants can't accept that. We believe the sacrifice of Jesus was completely efficacious, completely effective in doing everything that's necessary to forgive us of our sins. We also believe that it's not a matter of, oh, I had some, some sins I had confessed before I died, that I'm then going to be held accountable for those as being worse than the ones that I committed earlier in my life. We don't, that's not our belief. Our belief is that all sins that we commit are covered by Jesus Christ. Just look at Romans 8.1. There is now, now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven of those sins, and we therefore are welcomed into the kingdom of heaven because of what Jesus has done for us. Not for what we've done, not what a priest has done. Now, um, it is true, as I say, that those who are Christians who did not lead a good life, I believe Jesus has done a wag of his finger in our face, and and make us feel about as horrible as any person can be made to feel if we have not made at least made the effort to live a life according to what he desires. But our sense is that glorification, the giving of a perfected body, the receiving of our selves, our spirit and perfected body into heaven, that is what glorification is to the Protestant Christian. And so we don't need purgatory. Glorification means something different for us. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? It gets complicated when you start trying to understand because the theology is so different from what most of us have come up with and understand. 
right? And it's also true, you know, part of this, the reason why a priest has to be involved is, again, the, the thought is that grace is given only through the church, and it is given through the sacraments of the church. Grace is not accessible to us directly from God. It is only through the church. And there are a number of verses that they use to support that, uh, particularly you know, the, the passage in Matthew where Jesus, after Simon Peter professes you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says, uh, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, it, for it is not anything from earth that is told, that is let you know this. You are the rock on which I will build my church. Whatever you, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's the primary verse, they say, that gives Peter and his descendants, in terms of the position of Pope, the authority to forgive sins, to administer grace. And without the church to bind or loose, the Catholic belief is that you don't get saved. Um, now, they've loosened that up a little bit. John the Twenty-Third, who just was made a saint along with John Paul II, was the one who initiated the Second Vatican Council. Well, prior to the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic doctrine was that anyone who was not in good fellowship with the Catholic Church could not be saved. All us Protestants were lost and nothing could be done about it unless we became Catholics. Um, Vatican II changed that in the 1960s, and a lot of Catholics have never forgiven John the 23rd for that. In fact, I'm really surprised they got enough people to agree that he should be a saint. Um, I actually met some nuns at an event, at the G.K. Chesterton event, and they are, um, I don't remember the formal, the Latin title for their order, but it basically means the order of the vacant chair. Because they believe that when John Paul the 23rd, or when John the 23rd had the Vatican Council, that he um, invalidated his own papacy, and there has not been a legitimate pope since then. So they believe that since the 1960s, there has not been a real pope. And so they are a Catholic order who does not accept the pope, and they are the order of the vacant chair, the chair being the chair of Peter, you know, the, the, the cathedral, the, um, the chair. All right, so that gives you some idea where all that's coming from. But for us, glorification means the perfection that will come when Jesus returns and those who are in Christ are given a perfected body and invited into uh, into heaven to, to experience an eternity with him. Okay? A um, couple of verses about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Just a little bit later in the same chapter, in verse 53, Paul talks about those who will, um, the, uh, those who have, are now corruptible will put on incorruptibility. That is the perfection, that's glorification. Given the perfect body to live in heaven forever with God. And then Romans 8, 29 to 30, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, we won't get into predestination today, but you know what I think. Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus is called the firstborn because he was raised with a perfected body and we will likewise. The other people that got brought back from the dead, Lazarus and the widow of Zarephath's son, uh, son and all those people, they were simply resuscitated. They still had a mortal body and they still would die. Jesus is the first fruits of those who were, who were raised from de the dead incorruptible. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The glorification is yet to come when Jesus returns. Any questions about that? Again, remember, glorification is, while we are the ones to be changed and per, given a perfected body, the glorification is to, the, is to the glory of God. It is His honor, His majesty, His praise, and His holiness being realized in us when we finally become what God desires for us to be. And He will receive the glory for that. And we then will be able to glorify Him and praise Him and be in communion with Him 
for all eternity after Jesus returns. Um, another passage, in fact, I've referred to this, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, same chapter as that first verse, verses 51 to 53, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. Some versions say incorruptibility. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Sanctification, glorification. So the whole package of salvation, justification, when we accept Jesus Christ, sanctification, upon accepting Christ, the Holy Spirit applies that to our lives and comes into us, and then the process of, it's called progressive sanctification, as he heals us and makes us more holy, sanctifies us over a period of time, and then ultimately, finally, the final perfection, glorification, as we are prepared with a perfected body to enter into heaven. Any questions? Then that's all I have to say. That was a lot. Amen. So you get a half an hour vacation today. <laughs>